On June 25th, 1876, George Armstrong Custer rode into battle for the last time. He and his troops faced an overwhelming force of Lakota and Cheyenne along the banks of the Little Bighorn. And before the sun sank into the horizon, every man one of them was dead. When General Terry arrived two days later, the victorious warriors were already gone. The men on Reno Hill had watched in awe as the large progression, stretching for more than two miles, passed them by. And when Terry and his men approached, their first question was, where's Custer? They'd been so busy just trying to stay alive that they had no idea their commander had gone under. This news not only shook the surviving troopers to the core, but also the entire nation. A republic getting ready to observe its centennial now had to contend with its most celebrated hero slaughtered at the hands of so-called savages. As you can imagine, the reaction was swift. And in less than a year, the Great Sioux War would be over. And those who defeated Custer relegated to life on the reservation. Wooden leg among them. But what transpired immediately after the Battle of Little Bighorn? What events would cause the Northern Cheyenne to finally lay down their arms? And what would Wooden Leg get up to in the years following? I think the answer might surprise you. My name's Josh, and you're listening to the Wild West Extravaganza. On the afternoon of July 26, as the beleaguered troops on Reno Hill continued to fight for their lives, a large column of soldiers was seen approaching in the distance, General Terry, Colonel Gibbon, and their men. Initially, many of the younger warriors wanted to fight them as well, but others cautioned against it. Finally, Sitting Bull called off the attack, and by that night, what some think may have been one of the largest gatherings of Native Americans in all of recorded history, was once more on the move. Wooden Leg Cheyenne in the lead, traveling all that night and all the next day up Little Bighorn Valley. Just like before, they moved as one, hunting as they went, but game was proven elusive. That being the case, Wooden Leg and other hunters ventured far from the column in search of meat. And while they were somewhat successful, it still wasn't enough to feed such a large body of people. So they decided to split up, the various bands going their separate ways. Fear they'd all have a better chance of making meat if they were in smaller groups. And besides, after that last victory on the greasy grass, they really weren't all that concerned about soldiers. As for Wooden Leg Cheyenne, quote, We moved back up the Powder River. We camped and hunted all along far above the forks of the Powder and the Little Powder. We went over the Tongue River to the Upper Rosebud to the Upper Little Bighorn Branches. We got plenty of game and our horses had plenty of grass, end quote. In such a fashion, the Northern Cheyenne spent the remainder of the summer, just living off the fat of the land. By the way, if you're interested in learning more about the Cheyenne and their way of life, I would strongly recommend picking up a copy of Wooden Leg's book. Link down in this episode's description. It really is fascinating hearing from someone who was there, who grew up as a free Roman Cheyenne. For instance, at the tender age of 14, Wooden Leg was invited to join the Elk Warrior Society, of which his father was already a member. According to him, there were two other additional warrior groups at this time, the Crazy Dog Warriors and the Fox Warriors. And these groups sort of alternated duties, taking on the responsibilities not just as a military force, but also as tribal police. When it came time for the village to move to a new location, elders would appoint one of these groups to supervise. They'd not only guide the way to the next camp, but they'd also ensure that everything went smoothly, including keeping the other Cheyennes in line. I found this really surprising, but they were authorized to use corporal punishment, up to and including physical beatings and the destruction of personal property. Pretty much anything short of killing. To kill a fellow Cheyenne was strictly forbidden, and nearly always resulted in a forced exile. Now this did initially seem kind of harsh, but then again I'm reminded that tribes like the Cheyenne needed to be able to pack up and go at a moment's notice, sometimes when under attack. The ability to do so in an orderly manner could literally be the difference between life and death. As far as food was concerned, buffalo were the main source of sustenance for the Cheyenne, but Wooden Leg himself much more preferred the taste of antelope. They also routinely hunted elk and deer and weren't shy about dining on bear, fish, rabbit, even beavers and turtles. And when game got sparse, it wasn't unheard of for someone to resort to killing a dog or even a wolf for food although Wooden Leg was very clear that he didn't care much for either. 
Steel and flint was the preferred method for starting fires, and for kindling, they'd often use pulverized buffalo chips, of which there was most definitely an abundance. When it came time for burial, the northern Cheyenne did not place their dead up on scaffolds, like certain other tribes. Instead, they'd bury them in small hillside crags or even caves when available. If neither option was possible, the bodies would be deposited on the ground, somewhere off the beaten path, and covered with rocks. And according to Wooden Leg, there was no real marriage ceremony among the Cheyenne. If both parties agreed to be married, then they were married. And although in years past, young Cheyenne men would oftentimes purchase their wives, this was not the custom when Wooden Leg was coming up. Polygamy was practiced, oftentimes with wives being sisters, which according to Wooden Leg helped to reduce jealousy. Not sure how well that would go over nowadays, but hey, when in Rome. Marrying captive women from other tribes was also very common. As far as infidelity goes, there was no public penalty. No cutting off of noses or anything like that among the Cheyenne. A husband might punish an unfaithful wife, but this was usually done in secret as the other men would just mock the guy or otherwise ostracize him for letting his girl step out. Wooden Leg did not mention anything about men cheating on their wives, how common that was, or if the wives could do anything about it, but I did look into it a little, and apparently either spouse could initiate a divorce based on infidelity or just mistreatment in general. As I mentioned earlier, killing a fellow Cheyenne was strictly forbidden, but so was fighting. If two Cheyenne men started throwing hands, both parties would usually get whipped as a form of punishment. And if they kept it up, their property could also be destroyed. Now, I found this next part to be both interesting and tragic at the same time. Per wooden leg, suicide was not uncommon among the Cheyennes, for either sex. Distraught men would sometimes shoot themselves, and many a Cheyenne woman chose to take her own life via hanging. As a young boy, Wooden Leg discovered a girl who had hanged herself from a tree, and even his own aunt attempted to do the same thing from the inside of her lodge. Luckily, Wooden Leg's mother found her before it was too late, and they were able to cut her down. Not something you hear about too often. Now, I could not determine at what point Wooden Leg first went on the warpath, but he for sure participated in a raid on the Shoshone when he was just 16 years old. They attacked a small village, and after an initial skirmish, all of the Shoshone warriors fled except for one old man. And what do I always say? Never underestimate a pissed-off old man. Dude put up one hell of a fight, killing two Cheyenne and mortally wounded another before he himself finally fell. Wooden Leg remembered seeing the old warrior hacked to pieces, his hands and feet, even his head severed, before his chest and stomach were ripped open and the remains thrown on a fire. At the age of 17, Wooden Leg made what he called medicine for the first time, fasting and meditating for four days straight. And that's not a water fast, mind you. He said this was done both as a way to give thanks and in hopes of continued blessings. At other times, he'd stand in a creek or lake from sunrise to sunset, likewise, with no food or water. Goes without saying, but Wooden Lake Cheyenne were on very good terms with the Lakota, particularly the Oglala. And as such, he was fluent in their tongue, along with the universal sign language of the plains. Now, like I mentioned a moment ago, things were going pretty good for the northern Cheyenne in the first few months following the Battle of Little Bighorn. Hell, things were so good that Wooden Leg and nine other young men decided to go make a raid on the Crow to the west. The war party traveled for well over a week, and although they didn't run into any Crow, they did revisit the Little Bighorn battlefield. By this time, the dead soldiers had been buried, but Wooden Leg was still able to find an entire unopened box of ammo for his new rifle. Little did he and the others know that disaster had fallen upon their families to the south and that in their absence, the village had been attacked by a large force of U.S. soldiers and their Pawnee allies. Now, Wooden Leg never refers to any of these skirmishes by name, but judging from the various clues and the outcome, I'm relatively certain this was the Battle of Red Fork, also known as the Dull Knife Fight. On November 25, 1876, about 25 miles west of present-day Casey, Wyoming, Colonel Ronald McKenzie struck the Cheyenne with around 1,000 men, several hundred of whom were Pawnee and the effects were devastating. Not only were there around 30 Cheyennes killed, but just like back during the Battle of the Powder River, they lost it all. Their horses, lodges, anything they couldn't carry on their own backs as they made their escape was gone. So decimated were his people that Wooden Leg and his fellow warriors didn't even recognize them at first. 
Fortunately, they were once again able to find refuge among their friends, the Lakota. Quote, they fed us all we wanted to eat. They gave us robes and blankets and shared with us their tobacco. Gift horses came to us. Every married woman got skins enough to make some kind of a lodge for her household. Oh, how generous were the Oglalas. Not any Cheyenne was allowed to go to sleep hungry or cold that night. End quote. The Cheyennes would travel with the Sioux for the better part of a month until finally, in early January of 1877, they decided to split up once more. And that's when the soldiers returned, this time led by Colonel Nelson A. Miles. Although the fight that followed, the Battle of Wolf Mountain, was basically a draw, it was considered a strategic victory for the U.S. military. Not only did Miles eventually force the Oglalas and Cheyenne to retreat, but he also demonstrated that the army could successfully strike even in the harshest of winter conditions. Now, Wooden Leg had joined Crazy Horse and others in the various counterattacks, just putting that Springfield of his to use, but he also got some pretty devastating news. His sister, Crooked Nose, had been taken captive by the Bluecoats. I think all total, there were four Cheyenne women and five children that the army was able to capture. And there wasn't really anything that Wooden Leg or anyone else could do about it. Now, following this battle, the Cheyenne did split from the Lakota, as they had previously planned, and spent the next couple of months hunting along the upper Little Bighorn. Per Wooden Leg, almost the entirety of the northern Cheyenne were present up there for the remainder of the winter. And it didn't take them all that long to recoup their material losses. Quote, All of the people had good lodges. In every way, we were living yet according to our customary habits. We were not bothering any white people. We did not want to see any of them. We felt we were on our own land. We had killed only such people as had come for driving us away from it. So our hearts were clean from any feelings of guilt. End quote. Come springtime, they received a pair of visitors. One what Wooden Leg referred to as a quote-unquote half-breed Sioux, and the other an old lady named Sweet Woman who had been taken prisoner alongside his sister back during the Battle of Wolf Mountain. These two came bearing gifts and messages from the soldiers, saying that not only were the captives being treated well, but if they, Wooden Leg's people, would come in peacefully and surrender, there would be no punishments for past actions. This assurance came with promises of food plenty for all. A council was held, and although the Cheyenne didn't make up their mind one way or the other, they did decide to at least begin traveling in the general direction of Fort Keogh where the prisoners were located. And once they got close, they sent in a few chiefs just to test the water, make sure it was safe for everybody else. Sadly, this is when Wooden Leg learned of his sister's tragic fate. She was still alive when the Cheyenne chiefs visited the fort, and according to them, she was overjoyed at their arrival. This changed, however, once they departed. Apparently, Crooked Nose became greatly distressed. I don't know, maybe she thought they were leaving for good and that she'd never see her family again and she retrieved a hidden six-shooter and took her own life. To make matters worse, this was the same revolver that Wooden Leg had given her several months prior. The chiefs found out later that day when a runner from the fort caught up and shared the news, which they then passed on to Wooden Leg and his family. Quote, My heart almost stopped beating when I heard about her death in this way. She had been a good sister, kind to everybody. End quote. The Cheyenne would end up camping out on the Powder River for a spell, and a few of their agency brethren joined them there, further reinforcing the benefits of surrendering. Once more, it was stressed that nobody would be punished for their involvement in Custer's death or any other engagements with the whites. In the end, it fell on each individual Cheyenne to decide for themselves. Little Wolf, a highly respected chief and the head of the Elk Warriors, did choose to surrender, as did a few other leaders. A medicine man by the name of Charcoal Bear decreed that the tribe's sacred buffalo head and medicine lodge should go with Little Wolf's people. And according to Wooden Leg, this was the deciding factor for his family. Not him, though. At least not yet. While his parents and remaining siblings would head toward the reservation, Wooden Leg joined a group of some 30-odd Cheyenne under the leadership of Last Bull and began hunting and traveling, quote, all about the country on the Upper Powder and the Upper Tongue River. We had to be moving often because game was not plentiful. Every day, scouts were out trying to locate buffalo. All of the time, they were on the lookout, too, for soldiers or for crows and Shoshones. We were not loafing idly. We were working and earning our living, end quote. 
So yeah, they're free, but things aren't quite as idyllic as in times past. Families are separated, they're constantly worried about being attacked by soldiers, and even with such small numbers, they were still struggling to keep everybody fed. Eventually, they sent some men to spy on the conditions at the White River Agency, and they returned with news similar to what Cheyenne captives had said about Fort Keogh. Good treatment, nobody was being punished, there was plenty of food and blankets, other supplies, and that was pretty much all she wrote. Wooden Leg and his little band decided to go ahead and take their chances with surrendering. And by the way, this White River Agency was officially known as the Red Cloud Agency. There were three separate locations at different times until it was finally moved to South Dakota and redesignated as the Pine Ridge Reservation. Same name it carries to this day. Back in 1877, however, it was located on the White River near Fort Robinson in present-day Nebraska. It's a little confusing, but this was where Wooden Leg's family and those other northern Cheyenne had surrendered previously. I know earlier I said they traveled to Fort Keogh, which was true. That's where Wooden Leg's sister died. But their final destination was the Red Cloud Agency over in Nebraska. Same place where Crazy Horse and his band surrendered that same year. And to hear Wooden Leg tell it, things were pretty good at first. Although he and his fellow warriors had to hand over their guns, they were given all the promised gifts. Blankets, clothing, food. Hell, someone even gave Wooden Leg a wad of greenbacks so he could purchase additional items at the agency store. This honeymoon phase was extremely short-lived, though, as just a few days after Wooden Leg's surrender, the entirety of the Northern Cheyenne there at the agency were forced to pack up and head to an altogether different reservation hundreds of miles away in Indian Territory. Quote, Lots of Cheyennes were angry. We had understood that when we surrendered, we were to live on our same White River Reservation. We had given up our guns and our horses and had quit fighting because of this promise. Now, after we had put ourselves in this great disadvantage, the promise was to be broken. But we could not do anything except obey. So three sleeps after my small band had come to what we thought was to be our home, the whole tribe was on its way to what we now call Oklahoma. End quote. And yeah, things were not good for Wooden Legs people down there in the territory. It's the same old story we've heard time and time again with other tribes. They were poorly equipped, the promised food and goods never materialized, and disease ran rampant. Things got so dire that Chief Stolknife and Little Wolf just up and left, taking half the tribe with them, saying that the soldiers may kill us all, but they cannot make us stay in this country. This northern Cheyenne exodus is, in and of itself, a very interesting topic. But I'm not going to go too in-depth on it today. Mostly because Wooden Leg was not among those who escaped. He stayed behind in the territory with his family. All total, it was somewhere around 300 Cheyennes who made the exodus. There were several battles. If I'm not mistaken, there were around 50 Cheyenne killed, along with 30 or so soldiers and civilians. And when it was all said and done, despite all the trouble and the loss of life, they were not forced to return to Oklahoma. Instead, the Northern Cheyenne Indian Reservation was formed up in southeastern Montana. And it's there the escapees ultimately settled. Most of them, at least. I think a few found their way over to the Pine Ridge Reservation. Meanwhile, conditions continued to worsen down in Oklahoma. Per Wooden Leg, quote, Our people died, died, died kept following one another out of this world, end quote. His father, White Buffalo, shaking off the dust, was among these dead. Finally, after six long years in exile, Wooden Leg and the others were given the option to join their relatives up north. By this point, he had gotten married to a southern Cheyenne lady, and they, along with his mama and remaining siblings, made the long journey home to the new reservation in Montana. Believe it or not, in the years that followed, Wooden Leg would become a scout for the army working out of Fort Keogh, and much to his dismay, he was part of the group assigned to reining in the Minikanju chief Spotted Elk, a.k.a. Bigfoot, during the winter of 1890. And yeah, this means Wooden Leg was present for the massacre at Wounded Knee. Remember, history is nothing if not complicated. According to Wooden Leg, quote, We were told the Sioux were going to fight against the Cheyenne in that country, so we were willing to help our own people. When we got to Pine Ridge, we learned it was mostly the other Sioux tribes, not the Oglalas, who were wanting to fight against the white people. The Cheyennes living there did not want any trouble, so the bad Sioux were angered at the Cheyennes. Our Cheyenne relatives had their lodges torn down and burned. Bigfoot was the principal chief of the Sioux making the trouble. 
We knew him, and we were sorry at having to fight against him, but we were willing to be on the side of the whites and our own Cheyennes, end quote. Now, if Wooden Leg is to be believed, neither he nor any of his fellow Cheyenne participated in the actual massacre, but they did pursue some of those who fled. Quote, we Cheyenne scouts did not get into any battle. At one time, we were all dressed and ready, but the officers made us stop behind a hill while the soldiers went on and killed many Sioux at a camp on a little valley just over the hill. He goes on to say, quote, as the wounded knee fight was going on, the Sioux fled in all directions. The soldier officer now leading us was White Hat. He sent me out to a little hilltop to watch where the people running away might go, end quote. Now, it's not clear how long he and the other scouts spent in that area, but the remainder of their activity does mostly consist of them just trying to round up any other stray Lakota. From what I could surmise, Wooden Leg was not involved with any gunplay during this period, mostly just riding around in the snow trying not to freeze his ass off. Quote, the troublesome Sioux were gathered out in what the Indians knew as the Badlands. It was a very rough country having no trees and not much grass. The Cheyennes went out with soldiers and camped between the agency and that country. We kept watching, trying to find out how many were there and how many were going there and coming back to the reservation. It was winter and the wind was blowing hard there much of the time. We had some cold rides. End quote. Now over the years, Wooden Leg and his wife would have two daughters, both of whom they sent to a mission on the Tongue River for a proper education. This meant that when school was in session, the girls would live there full time. Be that as it may, Wooden Leg and his wife would visit the kids often, and each Sunday they'd bring them back home for a visit. In time, Wooden Leg even built a house on a nearby hill, which allowed him to sit on the porch and watch the children whenever they were playing outside. Unfortunately, tragedy would strike. My wife and I were pleased at their situation in life. They will have more of comfort and happiness than we have had, we said to each other. But the younger daughter fell into an illness when she was about 14 years old. We expected she soon would be herself again, but she grew worse instead of better. She became so weak she could not stay any longer at the school. She continued to go downward after we brought her home. Finally, her spirit went back to the great medicine. All of our love now was fixed upon the other daughter. She advanced to full womanhood. She could read the white man books, and she could write letters to our friends far away. But she too became ill, same as her younger sister. During all of one winter, she gradually wasted away. Every afternoon, her body burned with fever. Every night, her bed was soaked with the sweating. Every morning, she coughed almost to strangling. Neither the medicines of the agency physician nor the prayers of our own medicine men could help her. Just when the spring grass was coming up, she was buried in our mission cemetery. My heart fell to the ground. I decided that the white man's school is not good for Indian children. I think they do not get enough meat at the boarding schools. I think, too, that they are kept in school too much during the year. They ought to be out and free to go as they please during all of the good weather of autumn and the spring. It may be the white children can stand it to be in school most of the year. I do not believe, though, that Indian children can stand it. It is not good sense to have the whites and Indians living by the same rules. End quote. Now, despite such unimaginable losses, Wooden Leg would go on to live quite a long life. Not only did he receive a monthly pension due to his service as a scout, but in time he was appointed as a tribal judge. That salary, along with the pension, meant that he and his family didn't need to rely solely on farming. It also meant that they could help other, less fortunate families. Quote, We few are the rich men of our tribe of very poor people. Many of our old men and women have a hard time getting enough food. Some white people say to them, you have good land, so you ought to be prosperous. They appear not to understand Indians are not born farmers. Besides, many among us are older than I am. Even if they did know how to farm, they have not the strength to do it. Thirty years following the fight at Little Bighorn, Wooden Leg was present for a large gathering there at the battle site but he would decline to attend the big 50-year reunion in 1926. Quote, We want you to go to the great peace celebration, I was told. At each time of this talking, I replied, I'll think about it. The more I thought about it, the more I felt like staying behind. The battlefield is on the present Crow Indian Reservation. I do not want to go upon their lands. I have made up my mind never again to go to any place where I might be called upon to shake hands with a crow. End quote. 
Around 1908, Wooden Leg and some other Cheyenne visited Washington, D.C., and then via ship, headed to New York City before stopping at Philadelphia on the trip home. This is also around the same time that he got baptized into the white man's religion. I think the white people pray to the same great medicine we do in our old Cheyenne way. I do not often go to church, but I go sometimes. I think the white church people are good, but I do not believe all of the stories they tell about what happened a long time ago. The way they tell us, all the good people in the old times were white people. I am glad to have the white man churches among us, but I feel more satisfied when I make my prayers in the way I was taught to make them. My heart is much more contented when I sit alone with my medicine pipe and talk with the great medicine about whatever may be troubling me. Wooden Leg would pass away in 1940, at around 82 years of age, just a few years after he shared his story with Thomas Marquise. 1940. I want you to think about that for a second. It's conceivable that there are currently people alive right now who knew Wooden Leg when they were children. The stuff we talk about here on the Wild West extravaganza is not ancient history. I mean, that just blows my mind that there could be somebody alive at this very moment who personally knew someone who fought at the Battle of Little Bighorn. And that's about all I've got on Wooden Leg and the Northern Cheyenne. Thank you so much for listening. If you've got a hankering for more true tales from the Wild and Woolly West, please head on over to wildwestextra.com. While you're there, hit that contact button. Shoot me a message. And if you're really feeling frisky, go on over to buymeacoffee.com forward slash Wild West and buy me a coffee. Big shout out to Chris, who recently purchased a very generous 20 coffees. All right, till next time, remember, the God that made Crazy Horse and Custer both is not relegated to the confines of stained glass. Here's hoping we can all take a page from Wooden Leg and learn to speak with the great medicine in whatever state or stage we might find ourselves, and that we too might find contentment while doing so. Adios. I'll think about it.